Greetings, this is I, the Dalek Emperor, and welcome back to another Dalek cast. Today we have a lot of awesome questions from some very interesting people. First one is from Blue Knight Gaming saying, um, uh, hold on, um, oh, here we go. So apparently Blue Knight Gaming says, um, will you be doing another Among Us collab? Well, um, in my opinion, I have to say the entire Among Us craze has kind of died down, but, I mean, yeah, sure, sure, I'll, I'll definitely pl play it, um, but, um, I'm just, um, considering the possibilities of the whole Among Us trend getting, you know, uh, getting a bit dying, let's just say the whole Among Us trend is dying. Anyway, but yeah, I'll definitely, uh, play it sometime. Oh, we have something here. Dalek story suggests uh, backroom trouble, backrooms trouble, where some Daleks will no clip into the backrooms and face some uh, entities in there. Hmm. Yes, I will most definitely do that. I'll probably do it in my usual Minecraft stuff because I'm just getting started with Unreal Engine. Anyway, um, anyway, so we have a lot of video reactions that we need to go through. Thanks to uh, Jamie Alberding, and without further ado, viewers, let us begin observing them. Okay, so here are the videos in question. So, the first one is an annoying orange video, and it's called the Sunday Ice Cream Challenge. All credit will go to annoying orange for making this. And without further ado, let us begin observing then all credit. I'll put the link in the description as usual. Here's the ice cream Sunday challenge! Yes! Let's get ready to rumble! Yes, let's Orange? get ready yes, to rumble. Let me your voice, bro! I change my voice using this voice modulation ray! God, I want that thing! And you can have it if you eat a bigger ice cream sundae than your opponent! Yes! You kidding me? All I gotta do is eat a bigger ice cream sundae than he does? <laughs> I think Mike's bigger than his Miss Wings entire body over here! Hey, yo! Um, I have to agree! This doesn't seem, well, dairy bear! Hilarious! <laughs> Not to worry, Little Apple, because I'm giving you the first choice. Pick the largest Sunday you believe you'll be able to finish completely. If you don't finish the entire thing in three minutes... Really? Lose? Bro, all this voice modulating, then you just rubbing it in my face. Well, I guess I'll go with the smallest one on the end. The others are all bigger than I am. There's no way I can finish them. Plus, I already had a light one. This is too easy. I'll tell you what, bro. I am going with the biggest one. Oh, really? Sure, why not? I'm hungry as a horse. Might as well make it interesting. Okay. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Well, here goes the bed. Wait, huh? Please don't eat me. I'm just a widow Sunday. Um, uh, Orange, you didn't mention that my Sunday would be so alive. Didn't I? Uh, apologies for not communicating the conditions of this challenge. <laughs> Hilarious. Please, please don't. I, I love you. 
Oh my gosh! I can't do this! My Sunday loves me, Orange! <laughs> so you officially throw in the tiny towel? I mean, I don't see why it couldn't be a regular sized towel, but yeah! Deal. <laughs> Orange! Well, I suppose this gives me a great bad victory, Lee. Just gonna grab my spoon, loosen up the old stomach muscles a bit, and here we go, and get to work on this Sunday! Yeah! Excuse me? Um, do you intend to eat me? Well, like, uh, yeah, kind of. See, it's really a challenge video, and I really, really, really need that voice modulator, and you need this device more than I need my life. Oh, come on! I'm going to make me be the bad guy here, bro! But you must eat me in order to achieve your dreams. I guess so be it. Oh, thank you. See? This guy gets it. It's fine. But you have to eat me before I eat you! Wait, excuse me? Ow! Bro! What is that? What? Boys! Gonna challenge you running here! Thank you, this! Looks like just another manic Sunday! Ah! You got my left buttock! And it's delicious! Oh my god, that thing was terrific and disgusting! You'll scream before I get really hungry! Mommy! Thank you, Big Sunday, for standing up on behalf of Sundays everywhere! <laughs> oh, snap! No! That was cold! Yeah, right? that was cold! <laughs> oh. oh dear. What? What? Let's see what I'm thinking. Not only am I the largest Sunday in the kitchen, I'm also the largest object of any kind. And the more I eat, the greater my size and power becomes. Jesus! Yes! What? Complete and total control! Completely! <laughs> Teddy control! Oh, on Sunday? You want to stop using orange? Oh, did you say complete and utter control? I thought you said control! <laughs> I did not say control! Wow, well that's not very funny. Did you at least say utter control? <laughs> yeah, too. Oh my god, are you always this annoying? I'm so angry right now! Not so fast, Sunday! Oh, thank you, Rob! Ah, he's being panic! Oh, it hurts so much in my head! Bro, you forgot to control the most important thing of all. And what might that be? The thermostat! Yeah! <laughs> oh, genius!
Atomic voice enhancement machine inside my casing. I'll stop, stop bringing my fourth wall. May walk by my Do not feel my pain. Well, that's the same thing as losing your actual voice. Okay, but seriously, you should probably be able to you, I actually have my voice. Emergency! Right, okay, so we have this next one, which is... Uh, not to do with an advertisement. Stop this. I order you to stop this now. Oh, for, f oh, for goodness sake. These advertisements are getting irritating now. Okay, so, this is a Lego stop motion animation based on the battle of the Bismarck. Now, if you remember the Bismarck, the Bismarck was a gigantic ship controlled by the Nazis during World War II. World War II. I think this is once again another stop motion, vi uh, another video based on the battle of the Bismarck. Plus, we've already done this already, but doesn't matter. No. We've already done a a Viz Bismarck video, but I don't think we I don't think we did it in Lego stop motion, so whatever, let's begin observing. That has been detected heading to France to for repairs. Wait a minute, is that Star Wars music there? Um, okay, I'm worried this studio, uh, I'm worried about this, uh, making this video then. Machine it! Hold on!
ship. We're going to get, um, possibly arrested and taken to a POW, POW camp. Aren't they? Well, obviously. Considering that Germans, um, who are basically the bad guys of a situation. Okay, that was fun. It is time to move on to Yarn Hub's videos. First of all, Yarn Hub mystery is apparently. First is called Mothman. About a moth apparently, and, and a man, and I don't want to see another Tesco ad. No, not another sobbing Tesco ad! I don't wanna... Oh my goodness, really, really with these advertisements. They're really taking lunch right out of me today, aren't they? Anyway. Yes, so we have this video. Um, apparently in 1967 people had l some large reportings of a huge mothman apparently and I have no idea why. It's probably another SCP situation. Anyway, let us observe, don't know the sounds down, oh well, yeah, I know why, because of advertisements. Anyway, without further ado, let us begin observing, then all come, got to go to Yarn Hub. Oh yeah, so an OEA is using Unreal Engine, something that I am in fact, um, something that I, uh, well, not something that, um, I am definitely, um, definitely, uh, not using, and, uh, this is in factory alive. It's November the 12th, 1966, and in a graveyard in West Virginia, it's a cold night, and the men go about their somber work. The men are used to feeling a cold, icy shiver down their spine. Who wouldn't, under the same circumstances? But none let that stop them, and they keep their spirits up in the cold still of the night. The wind rustles. There's a whoosh. And was that a flap of wings? The men stop their work for a moment. What was that? There's something there. Look over by the trees. Something seems to be jumping from tree to tree inside the graveyard. Something huge. Something not human. There's a whoosh. Something Batman. As mighty wings flap. It might be then. That's something Batman would fight. And the man shaped creature flies over their heads and disappears. One of the grave diggers later described it as a brown human being with incredible speed. Three days later, on the night of November the 15th, 1966, in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, two young couples are driving in a car at around midnight. What is the stranger things? Which, if you must know, yes, I have officially seen Stranger Things. And I have to say, the Upside Down is more scary than the back rooms, in my opinion. The Demogorgon is fucking terrifying. They're out near the abandoned West Virginia Ordnance Works. It's a spooky and desolate place. Old World War II bunkers and abandoned laboratories have started to fall into disrepair, and nature is beginning to reclaim the polluted site that locals call the TNT area. It's a vast area with almost a hundred large concrete domes built into the ground to store explosives without being spotted from the air. Over 3,500 people worked there during 1942 oh, to 1945. Man. But now, there's no one. Just four young people in a car, driving along, having fun. 
Stephen Mary Millette, and Roger and Linda Starbury. The car headlights pick up shadows in the road ahead. In the rearview mirror, there's two red lights. Strange, as they didn't pass a car. No matter, they drive on. Then, something untowards is in front of them. Some thing. The headlights illuminate the terrifying apparition they see before them. Standing there is a man. A huge man. But it's not just the size. This man has wings. Massive wings. Ten feet or over three meters wide. Malette said it was like a man with wings. What is this scooby nonsense all about? It wasn't like anything you see on TV. Actually, this looks a bit more strange and things related. Or in a monster movie. Staring back at them, the creature had terrifying, huge, glowing red eyes. Two inches wide and six inches apart. Roger Scarberry said, I'm a hard man to scare. But I was getting out of there. They quickly drove on to Route 62. The creature was huge, but it was not to be judged by its size. Size matters not. This creature was fast, supernatural. Size does matter not. Pretty fast. It seemed to move 100 miles an hour. Taking off, it pursued the car, overtook, and landed in front. While on its muscular legs, it seemed to lumber awkwardly. But on the wing, it easily overtook the car. Linda yelled at Roger to drive faster. And they thought they had... And then they woke up and found out it was all a dream. Lost it. Questioning as to what they had really seen. Had they spooked themselves after seeing something perfectly natural? Rounding a bend, they passed a billboard on top of the hill. They weren't mistaken. There, on top of the billboard, was the winged man with glowing red eyes. The Moth Man. The huge creature spread its mighty wings and shot at great speed, up vertically, into the air. The occupants of the car were terrified, pushing the car faster, screaming. The Moth Man in pursuit. It seemed to be chasing the car. The, de the Demogorgon would defini definitely love you. All the while, weaving left and right over the tail end. They couldn't escape. Roger floored the gas pedal. 70 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour, 90, 100 miles an hour. And before you ask, Fuz, yes, I've been to the Upside Down. Yes, I've actually been to the Upside Down. I have to say, I had, I had a good time with the Demogorgon. We had some, had a lot of chat, uh, had a uh, chat, spoke about some things, about basically uh, stuff about conquering the universe. And then, um, and then decided later to kill him and basically begin full Dalek control of the Upside Down. The Mothman kept up flying left and right. The wings seemed to scrape on the top of the car, making screeching noises as they raked the roof. The That's right, Eleven. We are now in control of the Upside Down, so if you and your band of teenagers come round to the Upside Down, we will be ready and we will destroy you all! Friends were naturally rather perturbed. No. Sorry, Homelander, but I'm kind of busy. No. I don't want to watch your advertisement. As the car reached Point Pleasant, the creature, thankfully, veered off. The group, grateful to be... Also, also, Eleven, from Stranger Things. All, 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 all those powers you got from the Upside Down are just... Jedi powers, they are knockoff Jedi powers.
Be free of the monster and no longer alone. You and your knockoff Jedi powers cannot stop me. Went to the local dairy land. They argued about what to do next. Go to the police. The young women agreed that it was the right thing to do. They had to report it. The men, however, were a little more concerned with how that might look. They would be a laughing stock. Maybe if they could check if it was still there and then show the police the creature, well, that would be okay. The four climbed back into the car and set back along the road from where they had just came. They saw ahead what looked like a dead dog on the road. Then suddenly, it was there again. The Mothman lumbered out of the undergrowth in front of the car and took off and flew over the top of the car and into the field. The dead dog was gone. That was it. This time, they were going to the police no matter how stupid they were going to look. The police would just have to believe them. They parked at the diner and called the police. It was late and thinking it was just a prank or young people under the influence of something, Deputy Millard Halstead reluctantly arrived on the scene. The group relayed their night of terror to the deputy and the strange story of the muscular, abnormally huge winged man with supernatural speed. Halstead was a rational man. He wasn't going to believe their story as it was told, but something had spooked the four of them. They were obviously terrified, and he knew these people. They weren't your typical troublemakers. This was going to have to be investigated. The two cars drove back out towards the TNT area to see what they could find. Getting out of his car, the first thing the deputy noticed was that his radio was playing up. Static made it inoperable. Static and weird noises. The four young people stayed in their car, watching as the deputy shone his flashlight around the place. They swore they could see shadows dancing around the deputy. A cloud of dust from a coal yard was spotted by the couples and the deputy like something huge had taken flight. But other than that, there was nothing. The deputy returned to the station and filed a report. The four young people spent the rest of the night together with the lights on. The following day, the police held a press conference to discuss the sightings. Some of the press named the creature Mothman. In the 1960s, superheroes were becoming part of the culture and Batman had just appeared as a TV series. So maybe Mothman was a real-life superhero. The Point Pleasant Register ran the story with the headline Couples See Man-Sized Bird Creature Something. In an interview, Steve Mallet said, We understand people are laughing at us, but we couldn't make up all this to make us look like fools. Fortified by the daylight, the four of them went back to the TNT area. Maybe to find some proof that they weren't the local fools. Walking around the site, they found strange tracks. Exploring the site further, they found an old boiler. Steve forced the door open. As he did so, something huge emerged and flew up into the air, kicking up dust as it went. The four fled the scene. In the following three days, there were eight more sightings by various people, firefighters saw it. A man named Newell Partridge noticed buzzing and static on his television. And went outside with his German Shepherd. There, he spotted the Mothman in his flashlight. His dog went missing, never to return. The Mothman has been seen repeatedly since that time in many places around the world. Some believe its presence prophesizes disaster or tragedy. That was certainly the case in Point Pleasant, where the Silver Bridge collapsed in 1967, sending 46 people to their doom. Every year, Point Pleasant celebrates the phenomenon and holds a Mothman Festival that you can attend. There's a Mothman Museum and a huge chrome statue of the strange creature that fascinates and terrorizes even today. Let us know in the comments what...
Okay, so we have this video now called Where UFO landed in England. Now before you ask, no, this was not us. Um, definitely not us. Definitely not us, people. No, definitely not. It was, it was definitely... It was... <laughs> It was definitely, most certainly, not us. No, definitely not us. This definitely, this certainly did not have anything to do with us. Yes, uh, why would you say that? 5th of December, 1980. In Rendlesham Forest, in England. Just because a, a couple of humans were exterminated did not mean that was us. Is RAF Woodbridge, an airbase which is currently being used by the United States Air Force. The Cold War is on, but things are quiet at Woodbridge, although it is rumoured that nuclear weapons are held on the base or nearby. In the dead of night, a security patrol are checking the East Gate. They notice something out of the ordinary. There are red and blue lights around 300 meters away in the sky, just above the trees and descending into Rendlesham Forest. The lights now in the forest cause the entire woods to light up. Their only thought was that an aircraft could be in trouble and was putting down in an emergency. They decided to investigate further and drove into the forest towards the strange lights. Parking up, the two men ventured onwards on foot to what was now a glowing white light which was coming towards them. At this stage, nothing had been reported and afraid of using their radios for being overheard reporting such a strange phenomenon, they decided to drive back to the gate and phone in a report. Yes, that was definitely not us. Also, they had it a was strong us. feeling was, of dread, was and us. static in the air was I, noticed by both I men. admit it, it was us. We just came here to just exterminate a couple of humans, that was all. Um, we've got some strange lights in the forest here. Has, has anyone reported a downed aircraft? This Christmas, maybe Santa Claus decided to take a rest after all his hard work last night. <laughs> No, no, I, I'm dead serious. This is weird. Staff Sergeant Jim Peniston was sent to meet the two men and investigate further. Upon meeting the men, they pointed in the direction of the lights. Peniston saw a glowing dome of light in the woods. It must be a downed A-10. Quickly, questioning the two guards, he was told, no, there was no crash, and that it looked like a UFO had landed in the forest. Peniston ignored the crazy explanation he was given by the two guards and called into control. Were there any aircraft reported missing? Yes, don't believe him. He was crazy. It obviously wasn't us. It obviously wasn't the Daleks. No. Anything strange on radar? He was told that something in the air was being tracked in the area. A strange bogey had been spotted and then disappeared off radar. Peniston considered the options. If it wasn't American or British, then maybe it was a threat. Maybe even the Soviets. Peniston was given permission to go off base and investigate. Leaving their weapons behind, the three men headed into the jeep towards the crash site. Driving deeper into the forest, the woods were lit up by what looked like the orange glow of a fire with flashing lights in the middle. They'd gotten about as far as they could in the jeep, and radioed in to say they would approach the crash site on foot. On the way, the radios mysteriously stopped working. They were working intermittently, but something was interrupting with them. One man stayed in the jeep, and Peniston and an airman named Burroughs headed on foot to the site. While the lights were dancing, there was complete silence. That is, until a scream of a munchak deer pierced the night. At that point, as if on cue, all the animals in the woods started with a cacophony. The noise continued with the ground shaking, forest animals running away. Well, I know what to make a Dalek story of now. 
past Peniston, but then it suddenly stopped and silence returned to the forest. Peniston thought that maybe Burroughs was starting to lose it and went on alone. Emerging into the clearing, what he saw took his breath away. Unable to believe his eyes, he saw an object which seemed to be floating. A force field of milky grey and yellow light surrounded the craft in a dome shape. Peniston... Uh, yep, yeah, uh, yes. Um, that's basically what our force field does from time to time. It does emit a, like, a blue-ish, pinkish force field around some area or something. Then pushed himself through the force field, and suddenly all the details of the craft became clear. It was triangular-shaped, black and shiny. Under the skin of the craft, he could clearly see circular lights blinking in sequence along the side. Random colors and shapes formed and disappeared under the surface. Looking back towards Burroughs, he was shocked to see the man motionless, standing around three meters behind, bathed in a cone of light and fixedly staring ahead. Shouting at him, he received no response. He was just staring, his arms by his side. Peniston realized he was on his own. Inspecting the craft, he took photos and kept reporting on the radio his observations. Even if the radio was dead, then maybe someone could hear him. On the left side of the craft, he found some markings. Maybe it was NASA or USAF or even the Soviets. But no, these were like modern representations of Egyptian-looking hieroglyphs. Could it really be aliens? It is. Touching the glyphs, a bright light flashed before his eyes. Yeah, but, 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 yeah, it's definitely not us. He dropped the camera, we and then like some this. kind of data transmission, he saw streams of ones and zeros, and binary code in his mind's eye. The lights on the craft merged together, and grew brighter and brighter. Picking up his camera and retreating, he watched the craft ascend silently to around 80 meters, and then suddenly, it just disappeared. Burroughs had by now come back to his senses. The men went back to the jeep, the three of them reunited. They drove back in silence. After reporting the sighting, Peniston and some others went back the next day to the site. In the ground, they found three indentations where the craft had rested. Also, examining the clearing, they noticed several branches had been broken high up during the craft's arrival and departure. Physical evidence. Without telling his superiors, Peniston even went back alone and produced plaster casts of the indentations. But this was just the start of the Rendlesham incident. The following night, six more people saw strange green, white and red lights out near the east gate, with the object disappearing and then reappearing at another point in the sky. The guards, when checking the control tower, were told they had been observing those same lights for 90 minutes or more. Word had now gotten around the base of the extraordinary goings-on. Oh no, not another raid, Shadow Legends. Trailer, I don't want these Evening, in the Woodbridge Officers Club, a late Christmas dinner was underway, when Lieutenant Bruce England entered the club looking rather flustered and said, It's back. The Deputy Base Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt, took England to one side. What's happened? We were out in the forest. We saw something. A team was quickly assembled. Lights, cameras, tape recorders and night vision cameras. Geiger counters and weapons were gathered and they headed out towards the landing site. At the site, they found that they couldn't get the arc lights to work, but still went about taking radiation readings finding the site was about as twice as radioactive as the surroundings.
During the observations, through which audio was recorded in a handheld tape recorder, lights were spotted on throughout the forest. The men went in pursuit. They noticed that farmyard animals and the wildlife were acting very agitated. Amazed, they observed the object. They described a pyramid shape with what seemed to be a giant eye moving through the trees. It looked like it was giant eye, yes, um, yes, that's us. Blinking at them. I told those drones not to spy on humans while while trying to keep a low profile in space. Side to side, when you put the scope on it, it it's sort of spread a whole set, right? The dark series. When using the star scope night vision, they could see it had a dark center. The craft ascended, and incredibly, a beam shot down towards the ground. Eventually, the craft shot up out of view, blasting the airmen with icy cold air. Elliptical shapes that had detached from the craft lingered in the air for about an hour, before they too disappeared. Peniston was comforted to know he had film evidence and went to pick up his film from the processing lab. When he looked at the photos, all of them had been fogged. The radiation that had been detected had also ruined the film. There were many conflicting reports and alleged cover-ups of this incident. You can find the audio that Lieutenant Colonel Holt recorded on Wikipedia. We read the excellent Rendlesham Enigma by Jim Peniston and Gary Osborne in researching this film. In the book, you can find more on the meaning of the binary encoded message that Peniston was given. Damn. Our yarn hub mystery dog visited Rendell. Oh, uh, oh, this is like such a modern day now. Forest in researching this video. It's possible to walk the route that was taken all those years ago, and there's a campsite nearby. It's changed little in that time, and you can really get a sense of the strange happenings. There's even a reconstruction of the spacecraft that Peniston saw. When we wandered around, we were completely alone. Even in the daytime, the forest has an interesting feel. We decided we'd leave it to others to explore the forest alone at night. Oh, uh, yes, of course, I knew it. Uh, yes, yes, uh, and, and don't worry, viewers, it definitely wasn't us. It was certainly someone else, uh, and... Uh, yeah, it was certainly, um... Yeah, uh, it was definitely the Soviets. But anyway, we have another video made by Jan Hub, and this is called The Battle of Samar, apparently. Oh no, not another advertisement. I do not want another advertisement. Okay, what's going on here? It's the early morning of October the 25th, 1944 near the Strait of San oh, Bernardino so in the Philippines. Second Lieutenant War Commander still. Robert Witcher Copeland is having his morning coffee at the bridge of USS Samuel B. Roberts after a sleepless night patrolling the waters. They are part of Taffy 3, a carrier group made out of six escort carriers, three Fletcher-class destroyers, and five Butler-class escort destroyers like his own. Their mission is to provide air support for the landings of Leyte Gulf, which leaves the destroyers in a simple bodyguard and patrol role. It's shaping up as an uneventful task, 
That is until he receives a radio transmission warning him of surface radar contacts heading their way. Copeland doesn't even have time to take any action before one of his lookouts reports. Object on the horizon, sir. Everyone to battle stations! He orders without skipping a beat. Trouble lays ahead. In the distance, the center force of the Imperial Japanese Navy pushes into battle. It's made out of 11 destroyers, two light cruisers, six heavy cruisers, three battleships, and in the middle of them all is the biggest warship to ever grace the seas, the pride of the Imperial Navy, the Yamato. The commander of Taki 3 immediately directs the carrier group to move east in haste and lay down smoke. Aircraft take off from the carriers and engage. The planes throw everything they can at the Japanese. Bombs, torpedoes, depth charges, as well as strafing runs. But the Japanese force is just too vast, and the planes run out of ammunition and are forced to withdraw to rearm and refuel. Copeland relays the order, and the men activate the chemical smoke generators, as well as... Oh, Yamato, right, oh. Uh, I thought it, I thought it was the, I thought it was called the Yamato, but no, it's definitely uh, Yamato. Overload the boilers with fuel, causing the vessel to billow black smoke out of the smokestack. As they do, Copen spots massive, colourful splashes rising up from the waves. The Japanese are firing their first ranging shots. The rest of the destroyers mirror the USS Roberts quickly deploying a vast wall of black and white smoke in front of the carriers as they continue their run east, heading straight for an isolated storm. The splashes get closer and closer as the Japanese gunners zero in on their targets, threatening to strike at any second. But to the Americans' fortune, they reach a rain score and visibility drops drastically. The torrent of rain and the smoke screen combine to hide the vulnerable ships from the Japanese. The bombardment continues though, but with limited visibility it becomes inaccurate and slows to a crawl, giving the fleet precious time to regroup and prepare. Copeland is still coordinating the release of smoke when he receives a transmission from the commander. All destroyers are ordered to attack with torpedoes. Copeland swiftly asks if the commander wants Butler class and Fletcher class to attack simultaneously. The response comes back negative. The Fletcher class are to go in first. The Fletcher class ships push out into battle. Copeland is left waiting, listening to the thunder of guns through the mist and smog. The wait is tortuous. He thinks to himself, my god, how are we going to work this? Contemplating the dangers ahead, he gets on the loudspeaker and tells the crew, This will be a fight against overwhelming odds, from which survival cannot be expected. We will do what damage we can. The Fletchers complete the attack run and race away into the relative safety of the smoke screen, receiving strike after strike from the enemy fleet. Amidst the chaos, the second attack run isn't organized, and the Butler-class destroyers hesitate as to when to start. The Copeland doesn't wait. He slams the EOT to full power, and the ship charges into battle. He sails straight into the enemy at 20 knots. He identifies the heavy cruiser, Chikai, as a first big target nearby, almost in ideal position for torpedo attack, and orders to go straight for it. Enemy shells begin falling around him, but they push on fearlessly. Amidst the Hellfire, he radios Lieutenant Trowbridge, the engineering officer, and tells him, Lucky, as soon as we fire our fish, I will ring up flank speed, and you give me everything you got. Shannon intensifies. Geysers of seawater lift into the sky all around them, some striking mere yards away. A shell impacts the ship's mast, and the debris rains down upon the deck. A metal beam strikes the torpedo launcher, jamming it. Copeland is warned, but fortunately, the launcher is already aiming overboard. Already committed to the run, 
he eyeballs a new attack approach to account for the angle of the launcher and keeps going. Shells continue to pummel the seas surrounding him, but they too miss by sheer luck. Coming in hot, 4,000 yards away from Shikai, Copeland orders, fire, and the three torpedoes dive into the seas. The fish are away. The ship immediately turns to escape, and Copeland slams the EOT to flanking speed. Below deck, Trowbridge bypasses every safety measure. The boiler pressure rockets past its design limit, and the ship accelerates to a blistering 28 knots. Behind them, the HIJMS Chakai is rocked by an explosion as one of the torpedoes hits its mark. But they have no time to celebrate as other ships keep up their rain of shells. They keep running with all they have, zigzagging through a storm of high explosives. In the middle of it all, Copeland sees an Allied destroyer torn to pieces, limping along. Not another bloody advertisement I've been struggling with all of these today. The captain is standing on her stern, bloodied and hurt, still commanding the ship by shouting orders down a hatch to the engine room below. The captain gives Copeland a friendly wave as they sail by in the midst of battle. Copeland returns to a devastating scene. Nearly the entire fleet has suffered heavy damage, yet they still fight. Copeland radios his gunners and orders to open fire upon the nearest enemy, the cruiser Chikuma. The five-inch weapons fire upon the cruiser. They are pitiful compared to the firepower wielded by the Japanese. But the gunners are determined to make it count. They fire round after round into the exposed superstructure of the Chikuma, all the while dodging 8-inch fire themselves. Inside turret number 2, the gunner's mate third class, Paul Henry Carr, fires anything and everything that comes up the ammunition hoist. Armor piercing, high explosive, AA proximity fuse, even smoke and star shells used for lighting up battlefields at night. A similar scene takes place in turret number one, as the little destroyer tears through the superstructure of the Chikuma. Their accurate fire disables an eight-inch turret, and the star shells light fires all across the deck. The fight drags on for 45 minutes, during which the gunners fire nearly all of the five-inch ammunition stored on board. But then a lookout shouts inside the bridge, Captain! 14-inch splashes behind us. Copeland looks back, just in time, to see the massive water geysers lifting up into the sky, inches away from their stern. He runs for the EOT and pulls it to full reverse. The ship's hull shudders under the stress as it grinds to an abrupt halt. They even begin reversing when Copeland hears a loud whoosh of shells streaking overhead and sees them slam into the waters in front. Having dodged them, he pushes the EOT back to full flank ahead, but it's too late. An 8-inch salvo impacts the warship. A shell pierces the engine room and bursts the steam pipes of one of the two boilers. Another one hits below the waterline, and a third takes out all power and communications. The ship is wounded, and the Japanese can tell. The 14-inch main guns of battleship HIJMS Congo take aim and fire. The 1,400-pound shells smash into the vessel, tearing a huge hole under the waterline. Copeland orders abandon ship. The destroyer sinks as our gunners stubbornly continue to fire. An explosion rocks the insides of turret number two. The barrel and breech are now so hot it has prematurely detonated the shells' powder charge. A crew member enters the turret and finds Carr against the wall, heavily wounded, shell in hand. The crew member tries to help, but Carr only begs him for help loading one more shell into the breach, not realizing the gun is inoperable. Back at the bridge, Copeland has no more control, no power of communications, there's nothing he can do. He abandons the bridge alongside First Officer Lloyd Gurnett. The shells still fall around and into the dying ship. The pair run to the very bow of the vessel as it rises into the air and spot a life raft floating below. They jump. The burning USS Samuel B. Roberts remains afloat 
for one more hour until it finally capsizes and sinks under the waves, taking with her 90 of the 210-man crew. The Japanese attack was propelled by the unprepared carrier fleet at the end of the day, thwarting their attempts to intervene in the Leyte invasion and sinking three heavy cruisers, including Chikai and Chikuma. But the Allied fleet suffered greatly. Two carriers and three destroyers were sunk, and the rest sustained heavy damage. The chaos of the aftermath delayed the rescue. Men weren't picked up from the sea until 24 hours after the battle had ended some spending up to 50 hours floating adrift. Engineering officer Lieutenant Herbert W. Trowbridge and gunner's mate third class Paul Carr died in the encounter. They would both be posthumously awarded the Silver Star for their final brave acts, and Carr would have a guided missile frigate named in his honor. Lieutenant Commander Robert Wisher Copeland was rescued from the water alongside his crew he would be awarded the Navy Cross for his actions, and a frigate was named in his honor. He survived the war and resumed his law career back home. He passed away in his home city of Tacoma, Washington, on August 25, 1973, aged 62. Go. If that was fun, in my opinion. Anyway, it is time to end this Dalek cast for today. So, let's get back to me then. Anyway, my fellow subjects, I hope you enjoyed this video today. Once again, all credit will go to the developers of these videos. See you all in the next video then, goodbye. Thanks all for the enjoyable video.